Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Parks King Lecture. Yale Divinity School established this lecture series in the 2000 to 2001 academic year. We did so for three reasons. First, we wanted to commemorate the lives of two remarkable Americans, Rosa Parks, who on the 1st of December 1955 refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery City bus, starting a movement that we know as a civil rights movement. Along with her was a local minister who served as the spokesperson for the boycott against city buses that followed in the aftermath and then became the spokesperson for the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We secondly wanted to celebrate what they had accomplished in their lives and what millions of others who have joined in that effort have accomplished. I think the most poignant example of that is the election of Raphael Warnock to the United States Senate. Reverend Dr. Warnock is the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church and a former lecturer of the Parks King lecture. And third, in spite of what has been accomplished, we are aware of the challenges that confront us almost at every turn. Even one of the great accomplishments of Dr. King, the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, has been under threat and under duress with efforts to suppress voter participation. We have a great deal to do as events of the last year have reminded us all too painfully. And so we commemorate two great Americans. We celebrate what they and those who have worked with them have accomplished. And we challenge ourselves to join in that effort to achieve equality for all. We are doing so tonight through the good offices and the skill of a very noteworthy historian. And to introduce our speaker, we have our own illustrious Professor Danielle McRae. I'm Danielle McRae, and I serve as Assistant Professor of Homiletics at Yale Divinity School. And it is my honor to introduce the 2021 Parks King Lecture. The Parks King Lecture was established in 1983 to honor the legacies of Mrs. Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The lectureship highlights the contributions of African-American scholars, social theorists, pastors, and activists. This year, our Parks King Lecturer is Professor Barbara Savage, the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought in the Department of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Savage has the ability to peel back layers of the histories we thought we knew and reveal hidden complexities and unexpected implications. She is the co-editor with R. Marie Griffith of Women and Religion in the African Diaspora, a much loved text. She earned the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Award for her book, Broadcasting Freedom, Radio, War, and the Politics of Race, 1938 to 1948. The book explores how radio programs were vital precursors to the civil rights demonstrations of the 1950s and 60s. And Professor Savage was honored with the Grawmeyer Award in Religion for her book, Your Spirits Walk Beside Us, The Politics of Black Religion. Covering the entire 20th century, the book is an essential text for reflection on African-American religion and politics and illumines new dimensions of the work of Black women intellectuals like Nanny Helen Burroughs and Mary McLeod Bethune. Many of us are eagerly awaiting her forthcoming book on Murs Tate. 
Professor Barbara Savage has singular insights on Black institutions and on models of religious leadership. In the words of Claude McKay, her work touches both the surface and the depths of things. Friends, please welcome the 2021 Parks King Lecturer, Professor Barbara Savage. Let me begin with regrets that we're not able to share this event in person. I would have enjoyed a return to your chapel, one of the sacred spaces at Yale that sustained me during my time there in the early 1990s. Perhaps we'll be able to do that another time, but for now I am especially grateful to everyone who's made this virtual community possible. Students who suggested me for this lecture, Dean Sterling and other members of the faculty, and a special thanks to Lynn Haversat and Brock Harmon who handled the logistics and technical arrangements. And finally, thanks to everyone who is watching or will watch, as I invite us to think together about race, religion, gender, and politics in the two decades of what already appears to be a rather tumultuous 21st century. But first, let us pause to pay honor to Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr., for whom this lecture is named. As we all weather our own exhaustion from all that 2020 brought us in January of this year too, I was reminded of the mythical story of Park's tiredness as motivation for her refusal to give up her seat for a white man. But as Jeannie Theo Harris explains in her revelatory treatment of Parks, she wasn't tired from a hard day's work or no more tired than usual. She explained that she was tired of giving in to an unjust system that rested on what she named as the thin line between reason and madness. King put it another way in his first speech of the boycott. He spoke of the metaphysical tiredness of those black people who bore the burden of injustice through what he called a long night of captivity. Now my attention this evening to religion and politics owes its genesis to Parks and King and the many thousands more who risked their lives in the 1950s and 1960s to push this country forward. My own 2009 book on the history of ideas about black religion and black politics took a longer view starting the late 19th century, but coming to, through and beyond the civil rights movement. So I'll ask your indulgence as I begin by briefly revisiting some of the themes in that book before spending the bulk of our time exploring those, idea, those ideas and some new ones for the period between 2008 and now. How might we re-envision the study of black religion and black politics in view of what has happened in the intervening dozen years? That's the question I bring today and I look forward to discussing that together when we conclude with our question and answer period. Ultimately, I argued in that book against the idea of a mythic unified black church and argued for specificity for the consideration of the local and idiosyncratic nature of churches, especially in debates about the value of black churches as political networks. But I was also interested in the evolution of ideas about the public responsibility of black churches and traced those from the 1800s forward. I looked at the work of theologians, social scientists, historians, and the ways in which they addressed that issue. Now, the first generation of African-American scholars deployed all the academic tools at hand to indict Black churches, Black ministers, and Black congregants as a problem and a hindrance in the fight against racial inequality. And I have in mind here Du Bois and Woodson. For them, the search for an institutional base for Black political and social advancement seemed to run into a dead end at the church door. That was part of the broader problem, I argued, of the dearth of other Black institutions ready to take on that important work. Black social scientists in the 1930s and 1940s continued the work of studying Black churches, repeating the untested assumptions of the prior generation. So there were several major weaknesses in that earlier work. 
The most glaring was the insistence on black religious uniformity in the face of overwhelming evidence of just the opposite, the vast diversity of African-American religious beliefs and practices both within and outside of Christianity, including quite different ideas about political engagement. There was a complete lack of attention to the enormous role that black women played in churches. And finally, there was no anticipation whatsoever that churches, church people, and preachers would soon emerge as a site of what we now know as the civil rights movement. To remedy some of those limitations in my own work, I attended to the lives and works of Mary McLeod Bethune and Nanny Helen Burroughs as a way of arguing for the politically engaged work of women seen as primarily religious, like Burroughs, as well as the religiously important motiva motivations of political women like Bethune. I studied the political and religious thought of Benjamin Mays to argue for the emergence of something I called a politically engaged Southern black liberal Protestantism. Finally, I looked at the ideas on religion and politics of the young people of varying religious and non-religious backgrounds who experienced the transformative ethos of black religiosity within the civil rights movement itself. So then I thought I was done, except I wasn't as it turned out. Because in the spring of 2008, when I was concluding the draft of that book, I found myself drawn into a real time manifestation of the very issues I was studying. As an historian, I'm obligated by training to think of change over time. I'm also reluctant by temperament to engage in my work with contemporary political analysis without the benefit of hindsight. But you may recall the controversy when recorded experts of Reverend Jeremiah Wright's sermons generated trouble for his parishioner, then Senator Barack Obama, who was in the middle of fighting for the Democratic nomination. That then became the final chapter of the book. And I wanna use that incident as the point of departure for the rest of our time together, as we then move from then to now, from 2008 to 2021, with key junctures along the way. So just to remind us, let's remember that for Obama, Reverend Wright's church, Trinity UCC in Chicago, was key to his search for community, for racial identity, for an anchoring place, and for the kind of redemptive political work he associated with the civil rights movement. There he learned, in his own words, quote, that religious commitment did not require me to suspend critical thinking, disengage from the battle of economic and social justice, or otherwise retreat from the world. He would later write, I'm grateful not only because I was broke and the church fed me, but because it led me to everything else, saying that it led him to Jesus, to Michelle, to his two daughters and to his public service. It was to Wright that Obama had professed his embrace of Christianity. It was Wright who married the Obamas and baptized their daughters. When Wright's videotaped sermons were taken out of context and circulated, Obama understood it as an attempt both to blacken him and to paint him as too radical for white voters. But he also knew that he could not afford to let the controversy separate him from the black electorate on which his campaign depended. This was especially true of black women voters who constituted the majority of the black electorate and of black congregations, although they remain the largely unseen force in both arenas. Obama succeeded, at least temporarily, in his speech in Philadelphia by employing a politics of black religion that also deflected the politics of race. He relegated his religious mentor and black theology to a bygone era marked by racial division and pain. He cast right as a relic of the past. And later in the campaign, he also would sever his ties with Trinity entirely. Now in a speech to the National Press Club in Washington DC, Wright had come to his own defense, explaining his sense of call and the mission of his church. Wright's largely ignored address, overshadowed by a contentious encounter with the media which followed, 
was a masterful account of black religious history, stretching back to the 1600s, to slavery and to Africa. Wright placed himself and his church's work in the much longer biblical and historical tradition of prophetic ministry and theology, stretching back to the prophet Isaiah. In his understanding of that tradition, one not only helps the poor and less able, but also works to change oppressive prevailing social orders by criticizing those who rule and hold power, whether in the state, in the economy, or in the military. Obama, however, believed that with his leadership, he could advance the perfectibility of American democracy, resting on his faith in the Constitution and the band of patriots who drafted it. But Wright believed himself to be no less the patriot, having served honorably as a Marine. So in those and other ways, this politician and this preacher were destined for conflict when Obama aspired to control the reins of the national state and its military power. I do what pastors do, Wright said, and referring to Obama, he does what politicians do. The broader lesson of that controversy is that the simple dichotomies that drive most discussions about race, religion, and politics still have such traction because African-American religion remains a subject of much mystery, much misunderstanding, and much manipulation, especially by an unknowing mass media that relies on and invents fights and controversies. One side benefit, however, was that the idea of black theology became known not only to divinity schools, but to folks who listened to NPR. Over time, one can chart the maturation of Obama's own faith and of his willingness to also speak more forcefully about religion and racism during his presidency. That was on display during his 2015 eulogy of the Reverend Clementa Pinckney. Obama spoke of Pinckney's dual status of being pastor and an elected official as a distinction historically more common among black people. As if to prove his own point, it was there that he assumed the role of the singing black preacher reaching for the tune of amazing grace. When he did that, choosing to try to embody both the black preacher and the black politician, I was reminded of Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign against Al Gore, when in what Gore intended as a dismissive put down, Gore said about Jackson, we are electing a president, not a preacher. But here Obama was trying to inhabit both roles. And I say trying because there is still a part of me that sometimes feels unease when he affects, as he has done before and since, the acquired cadence of black preaching. The Obamas are still both deeply affected by that controversy in 2008. So too was Wright, it seems, who continues to criticize the former president, both politically, which is not unexpected, but also personally. The former first lady's book still casts Wright as a relic of a bygone racial era. The president's recent book is more damning. He subjects Wright to ridicule, deploying stereotypes of black preachers while carefully cloaking his criticisms in a social setting where they are shared by a group of black friends eating fried chicken and drinking beer. In fairness, the media firestorm fire overtook a politician, his pastor and their families and apparently hurt them all in ways beyond our knowing, as often happens when religion, politics, and the personal get entangled in painful ways that have not yet permitted the full return of grace. At about the same time that we witnessed the horrific grief and loss in South Carolina, two new activist movements emerged and remain with us today. Stimulated by different events, both raise different questions about how we see Black religion and Black politics. The first is the work of Reverend William Barber, a politically apt successor to the ethos of the civil rights movement. 
And the second is the Black Lives Matter movement. Both came to national visibility during Obama's second term and both rest on grassroots organizing, but aided and brought to greater prominence by the technological innovations of the 21st century. So first to Barbara. Raised in the Disciples of Christ by his parents, including his father who was a pastor too, Barber still works from that denominational home, although his ministry has included stints as head of the North Carolina NAACP. His work on political issues there had begun in 2007, but he rose to national attention with his Moral Mondays campaign. With that, in 2013, he brought old style weekly protests and civil disobedience against a new Republican, Republican regime in that state one that opposed the extension of Medicare, that cut employment benefits, reduced support for higher education, and imposed new voter restrictions. For Barber, the moral measure of politics rests with how we treat the poor and those at the margins. He included a harsh critique of the religious right, accusing them of focusing on issues never addressed by Jesus, like abortion and homosexuality while ignoring poverty, empathy, and justice, ideas Barbara most associates with Jesus. I worry about the way that faith is cynically used by some to serve hate, fear, racism, and greed, he explained. For him, religion and politics made for a simple list of demands. He says, pay people what they deserve, share your food with the hungry, do this, and then your nation shall be called a repairer of the breach, quoting from Isaiah. And in order to do that, Barber worked to build an interracial fusion coalition, united not by race, but by shared support for a pro-labor, anti-poverty campaign for jobs, housing, educational equality, health care, criminal justice, and voting rights. From that was born his current work on a poor people's campaign, which is a Latter-day successor to King's unrealized final work. In these ways, Barber embodies in style, in content, and in location what many of so still associate with the Southern Civil Rights Movement. His 2016 speech at the Democratic National Convention called on us to act as moral defibrillators, to jolt the nation, into doing what was right to serve those who have the least. His delivery of the homily at the National Cathedral the day after the inauguration, the inaugural prayer event, touched on all of those themes as he preached again from Isaiah and called on the new administration and on all of us to repent and become repairs of the breach through our policies and through our actions. His call for a third reconstruction rejects the politician, politics of division, and embraces one of justice and service, especially to the poor. Like Barbara, local grassroots organizing also undergirds the Black Lives Matter movement. Created in 2013 in reaction to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's killer, it brought together a new national network of a much younger generation already hard at work in their own communities. More typical than usual, the three black queer women, Patrice Cullors, Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, who launched the Twitter hashtag, were seasoned and successful political activists and organizers, as were many of those who joined them. Deploying digital communications, videotaped cell phone visuals and protesters in the streets, the Black Lives Matter movement cast itself as a movement of radical inclusion. It centers its leadership and local chapters on those left out of earlier movements, specifically women, queer and transgender people. The sad recurring specter of police killings of unarmed black men and women catapulted the hashtag and an online community into something much bigger. The police murder in New York of Eric Garner in July, 2014, 
and of Michael Brown and Ferguson three weeks later, and the quick succession of all too many other names and deaths brought more protests and now familiar chants of I can't breathe and hands up, don't shoot. And the killings by police continued, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Sandra Bland. The power of their message and of what they'd been trying to build became hyper visible when George Floyd was killed by police last summer for all to see. The reach of the phone videotape of his murder made clear that over policing and egregious actions by police, here for the alleged offense of passing a counterfeit $20 bill were made vivid. With so many on COVID lockdown from the usual busyness of their lives, attention to the killing transformed Black Lives Matter into an international movement marked by protests and marches of unprecedented scale. This was truly a mass movement. Under the urgency of the moment, the diversity of those marching, especially the numbers of young white people expanded exponentially. There was some clarity that all lives cannot matter until black lives matter. Now, some have referred to Black Lives Matter as both a spirit and a movement. I was first in the presence of some of those who work within this movement locally and long before the most recent events, initially at a forum at Mother Bethel Church here in Philadelphia. And I've had several other much later interactions, including with the three founders and with Darnell Moore, just to name a few. What I immediately noticed was a faith in the possibility of change and a strength of spirit that also was reminiscent of the 1960s to me. Yes, there also are pastors and religious lay people affiliated with the movement, something often overlooked and something there from the beginning. But I mean here the actual ethos and energy of the people who are leading from within. I saw in them and felt from them a deep spirituality. I could not ascribe a theology to it, nor capture it in a category or a particular faith tradition, but it was there and it was powerful. And I was surprised to feel that. And this is a term that came to my mind, that something about them felt a little churchy to me. Now, that's my term and it's certainly not theirs, but that is what I felt in their presence. Because in reality, many of their ideas about politics were formed in reaction against organized religion's failures and rejections of who they are and what they believe. But I see an underlying connection to a larger sense of call, a larger sense of healing and outreach, and yes, a larger sense of outrage over injustice. Their rhetoric is filled with talk of healing and wholeness and spiritual work. With growing notice of their work came increased lines of attack against them. One being that the movement was anti-religious or a cult or secular humanism. They also were being accused of being terrorists, anti-American, radical, demonic, or dabbling in witchcraft. In other words, they have been called everything but children of God. But the religious criticism had the inverse effect of drawing attention to the spiritual work undergirding the movement. When Pat Robertson called the movement anti-God last September, Patrice Cullors explained that the group welcomed people of all faith traditions or none, but perhaps more importantly, she said, and I quote, there are many spiritualities that further repress and subjugate people in their communities, but I'm calling for spirituality to be deeply radical in its ability to heal people. I don't think we're people to be fixed, but rather how do we hold faith for people who've had harm caused to them in a way that makes them feel like they have agency again. That's what spirituality has the ability to do. Raised as a Jehovah's Witness and now a Yoruba practitioner, she and other members have adapted rituals to help heal the trauma of the violence visited on black people. As she puts it, the fight to save your life is a spiritual fight. 
For Reverend James Lawson, witnessing this movement takes him back to lessons learned in the Methodist youth movement before he began his work in the civil rights movement of the 1940s and 1950s. He has seen what others chose to ignore, and I quote him here. They have organized around the grief and offered a ministry to the families of the black men and women who have been shot and killed by police. They have helped those families to grieve, help them to be empowered, to not let the murder, the execution of their child go quietly away. And that's why he calls Black, Black Lives Matter a modern religious movement and a ministry of healing. He explains it this way, together, the movement and families are saying, this is not God's will. In it, he sees the potential for a movement whose justice work around policing will bring fruit far exceeding that of the one he also ably helped lead. Those within it see their movement as a freedom movement, as a liberation movement, which like others in the past, releases us from the control of traditions of habits of mind, and yes, of state practices and policies, of hierarchies of power all around us. And so I am grateful to the Black Lives Matter movement for its energy and its engagement, for adding complexity to our understanding of Black spirituality and Black politics, and for challenging all of us to think through what it means to liberate one another so that we may all be free. Now, 2020 has certainly brought us much loss and longing. I've especially missed being in church on Sunday mornings, as have many of you, I'm sure. I'm a member of the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, the first Black Episcopal Church in the, in the country, established here in Philadelphia in 1792. The familiar blend of ritual and music and community that starts my week has been transplanted to this machine through which our church communicates now. The communal work of my church, like many others, has continued through phone calls, mask doorway visits, Zoom prayer meetings, Zoom Bible study, and Zoom worship. We've tried to take care of one another. We grieve with those who grieve without the comfort of funeral rituals. I've been to Zoom memorial services and Zoom graveside services, but I've also been to some joyful Zoom weddings. So we have redoubled our work to help those who have lost income or need food. So the work of our church has continued. Following the liturgical calendar through Lent, Easter, Pentecost, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, season celebrated, but in absentia. And that's what has led me to think once again that black churches have become invisible institutions. To use the term Albert Rabateau coined for religion among the enslaved before the establishment of black churches. And yet it's been heartening to witness the COVID related work done through churches here in Philadelphia and across the nation. Here, churches in coalition with black doctors open testing sites and are now turning the work of many, making their spaces available for vaccinations too. And here as elsewhere, black churches are being called to duty as the information and pastoral networks that they are, offering reassurance about the efficacy and safety of the vaccines. The COVID crisis also had me thinking about the role of black churches and their networks in the 2020 elections. The familiar pre-election scenes of politicians and black churches disappeared, but the patient work of voter registration and turnout continued despite the pandemic. And yet black religious people are at the heart of the change we witnessed in November and in January in Georgia. Stacey Abrams, the daughter of not one but two United Methodist preachers, 
places her religious upbringing and her faith at the heart of the work she's done as a state legislator and organizer to expand the franchise. She has said, and I quote, I was raised to believe that my faith should never be a sword to strike down another community. It should always be a shield to protect. The reason I consider myself a progressive is that my reading of the Bible says that Jesus was a progressive. The faith I practice believes in active service and active engagement. So she's embraced her faith as part of her campaigns and, and has relied on church and other local networks aided by technology to organize around voter registration over the last 15 years. Her faith has also helped her deal with the disappointment of losing the Georgia governor's race. I hope my witness is always seen as one of perseverance, said Abrams. I may not have been governor, but that didn't absolve me of the responsibility that my faith tells me I hold, which is to ensure that the marginalized, the voiceless, the disadvantaged are able to be heard and to be served. Abrams turned to Isaiah's concept of faithful endurance, describes her work and that of the prior civil rights generation. She says, I am the product of the Voting Rights Act, an act that was bought and paid for on Edmund Pettus Bridge with foot soldiers who had believed that they had the right to be there. Her biblical fluency is rivaled only by her grassroots organizing and fundraising skills around the vote. She said, in this country, democracy is how we speak to those in power and how we determine who holds power. And that's my mission. That sense of mission and spiritual endurance helped turn Georgia purple, not only in November, but in January too, when two new senators also won and took the oath of office two weeks ago from Vice President Harris. Raphael Warnock withstood the copycat attempts to paint him with black religious radicalism. But Jonathan Walton was forced, now Dean of the Divinity School at Wake Forest, to once again explain in a Washington Post op-ed exactly what the black prophetic tradition is. This time, though the preacher and the politician embraced and merged as Warnock ran as Reverend Warnock, as if Reverend was his given first name. With the co-election co of John Ossoff, who also places his Jewish faith at the center of his call for service, some have cast their election as a reminder of the multi-faith, multi-racial, Black Jewish coalitions of the civil rights movement. But to me, all of this nationally and in Georgia also signals a moment of progressive religious revival. And so the early 21st century has been dizzying with its torrents of evil and some good. Early in her life, Nanny Helen Burroughs wrote, that indefinable thing that we call time travels so fast that the past is gone and the present becomes the past, even while we attempt to define it. And like a flash of lightning, it at once exists and expires. So when the religious history of the 21st century is written, yes, of course, it'll grapple with the white religious right and Christian nationalism, but that's not what I do. And I look forward to the work forthcoming on that issue, namely, especially work by Aubrey Hendricks, a new book entitled Christians Against Christianity, how right-wing evangelicals are destroying our nation and our faith. It's a book that's due out this summer. But it will be just as essential for scholars to pay close attention also to this moment of progressive religious revival and to the diversity within Black religious religion and politics in this era. It stands at the heart of the American religious diversity now on full display at the White House, where President Biden, only our second Catholic president, weaves his faith into his life of service, 
in ways that remind me most of President Carter, who continues to live out his faith and his politics. Vice President Harris, married to a Jewish husband, was raised both Baptist and Hindu, but she somehow escaped some of the criticisms lodged at Obama. But had her Indian mother been Muslim and not Hindu, I doubt that would have been the case. So a variegated religious landscape is already a hallmark of this new administration. Religious diversity was certainly on full display in the digital artistry of the virtual inaugural prayer service held the day after the, the inauguration. It was a very moving montage of prayers and prayer traditions from men and women, straight, gay, and trans, and across many faith traditions. And yes, its public events also dramatically highlighted, highlighted black religious diversity from Yolanda Adams to the new black Cardinal of DC to the black Episcopal Dean of the National Cathedral to the AME pastor who closed the inauguration. And yes, to that young black Catholic poet who lifted our metaphysical tiredness and released our spirits to soar beneath a bright January sun. And with that, I'll end so that we can talk to one another, thanks to the marvels of the 20, 21st century. Thank you so much for listening and for this opportunity to learn together.